welcome to all of you. Welcome around the world. I'm happy to see you all again. Um, we have Christoph um, from the bed with us right now. He just told us he has COVID and all our best wishes are going to you and your wife, Christoph. And we hope you will recover soon. And we are happy you are with us, um, although in, in pain and in bed. I hope you can stay with us during the lecture. All the best for you. Thank you so much. Um, so last Tuesday, we had that wonderful um, lecture by Constanza Kalix, and it's already, I think it's already um, um, published, so you can download it if you like. And um, today, I, I'm very pleased to welcome Markus Lindholm from Rudolf Steiner University College in Oslo. From Alanus, we have a very close and long time um, relationship and collaboration with um, Rudolf Steiner University College. Actually, we have a master program at Alanus University, which is um, originally from um, Rudolf Steiner University College in Oslo, and we can offer it at Alanus. So we are we are really colleagues and working together. We have um, we published that Rose Journal together. Maybe Katarina can um, give the um, internet um, address into the chat. So there is a very close relationship, and I'm very happy to have you with us, Marcus, today. Markus is also a long time Waldorf teacher, has been teaching at Oslo Waldorf schools for more than 15 years, and he's a science teacher. He did his studies in biology and geography at Munich and um, in Oslo, and he received his Waldorf um, training, teacher training from Dornach. Um, and he has been a, um, a professor at Rudolf Steiner University College as far as I see for more almost for tw first associate professor and now full professor for more than 20 years and he is doing the science education. And he has recently published a wonderful bo a book with a wonderful title. Um, I can't say if it's wonderful, but the title is just wonderful. Curiosity, deep learning in the age of information. So, and especially this idea of deep learning, this sounds very nice um, to my ears. And there's also a paper um, published, um, which you can download. Katarina is putting the, the address of the paper into the chat. So, which is um, in relation to to the talk Marcus is giving us today. So we are very happy to have you here and looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you. Thank you. So hello, everybody. And uh, greetings from Oslo. Uh, right today, I will, I will show you my some slides. I have uh, 12 slides uh, to show you. Um, and, and you will see at the first slide, slide uh, please note the background picture because it's, it's from the uh, university college and you will see it's quite snowy because today we have the first day with snow here in Oslo and of course the kids are quite happy. Um, uh, well, I think I'll share, uh, already start to share the screen with you because I think the, the, the slides, although as a uh, sworn Waldorf teacher, I hate PowerPoint, but uh, uh, talking in English, I think uh, giving some slides will give some structure and support to my talk. So um, here we go. Uh, this one. Katarina will help me if, if it doesn't work. Looks it's good. quite good. It's quite good. Quite good. Okay, perfect. So there we are. So let's begin. Uh, I have calculated 60 minutes talk and afterwards we have a come talk and discussion about what I present. Uh, the, the, um, the talk I will give is about science education and curiosity. And uh, it has three parts. The first one, I will talk 15 minutes about uh, more principally and conceptually what, what is wonder. Sounds boring, but it's quite interesting. What, what is it to wonder actually? And what is it to be curious? So that will uh, take 15 minutes. And thereafter, I will um, try to, to, to shed some light on, on the wonderful problem of uh, child development, or let's rather say 
development in general. Because developmental thinking, although we all know it, uh, it contains some quite puzzling aspects. Um, so that will take another 15 minutes. And after that, um, I have calculated 30 minutes uh, focusing on a few aspects uh, of the two former uh, subchapters, a few aspects, how this has consequences for education and especially science education. Okay, so let's begin. Although we seldom think about it, uh, is one precondition in the child quite crucial for any education? And this precondition is um, the willingness, the, um, the aim, the trying, the wondering, the curious mind, the, the, the long last, the last for for answers, for knowledge, for perspectives. Um, without children uh, who have questions, a school cannot be possible. So any education depends on a feature of children, the, the feature of being open, and asking about what is it all about? What is this really? And what are those preconditions? Um, oops. On uh, Swedish banknotes, uh, you have a portrait of Carl von Linné. And with a small inscription, Omnia Mirari Etiam Tritissima. It says, find wonder in all things, even the most commonplace. And I think it's the quote is quite nice. And it's also nice that it comes up during the Enlightenment because most things we get conscious of are things we are about to lose. And during enlightenment, uh, possibly one aspect, one naive aspect of the soul possibly was about to get lost, uh, the wonder. And that could be the reason for Linné to focus on it. Wonder, and uh, at the same time, I think, uh, this banknote is quite symbolic because it says that the real capital of a developmental society is not money, it is uh, knowledge, and knowledge is uh, based and dependent on wonder and curiosity. Without wondering children, without wondering people, asking new questions, uh, no development, no innovations are possible. And hence, this, of course, is a basic premise for our developmental modern society. And therefore, I think it's quite symbolic, nice, that uh, this quote is put on the banknotes. Accordingly, uh, both wonder and curiosity is plentiful mentioned uh, in all uh, political uh, science uh, talks, in programs, uh, in scientific programs, in science education programs, in Nobel Prize dinners. Uh, everybody talks about the value of curiosity and the value of wonder. And uh, this is somewhat slightly astonishing because um, in fact curiosity especially has no good repu reputation in general historically. On the contrary, um, curiosity kills the cat. You might have heard curiosity 
uh, of course, was the reason for the expulsion from paradise uh, and lots of other problems. Uh, Augustinus was quite critical to curiosity and most, uh, most thinkers have been quite skeptical to curiosity, at least the, uh, the special kind of curiosity which I uh, present to the left uh, down here in the corner where a kid, a boy, is looking through a keyhole. Because curiosity to most people are associated with um, stick, putting your nose into things which you are not, should rather stay away from, looking through keyholes or this, uh, all the other examples. You will be familiar with that kind of curiosity, uh, commonly called diversive curiosity. Uh, so how is curiosity to distinguish from wonder? Uh, let me use an example. If you, if you are on an old jetty standing and looking into a lake water, for instance, or lying on a boat like my son here in the Okavango Delta in Africa during my PhD work, uh, looking into the water, uh, you see plants, you see stones on the bottom, you see maybe a fish or uh, strange things, maybe a crab. And then you can start asking, hey, what is underneath that stone? Is it a crab? Or maybe it's a perch or maybe a crocodile. Is it a crocodile behind that log? The thing with such questions is that they can easily be, uh, be answered. Uh, you can uh, you can explore, you can test out, you can find the answer, and you will be satisfied. This is the kind of diverse curiosity. And the nice thing with uh, this kind of curiosity is that you also can continue asking. You can ask, what kind of perch is it? Is it a male or a female? What is the perch doing there? Uh, is it feeding? Is it hiding for some predator? Or what is going on? Okay, so this kind of curiosity generates new answers and new questions, but after a while uh, you get satisfied, so it calms down. Diverse curiosity is not very long-lasting uh, powerful. But at the same time, while looking into the water, you can also get a somehow almost creepy feeling by looking into the water and you get the strange feeling uh, trying, maybe not uh, clear asking even, how is this world down there possible after all, underneath water? How is that possible? The thing with this kind of asking is that it's much more difficult to answer. Uh, and that is typical for wonder. Wonder, wonder is more um, holistic, more silent, and it's typically associated to situ situations, uh, for instance, landscapes, beautiful landscapes, for instance, a rainbow. And the thing, uh, typically, it's hard to, to, to find good things to say about this view. For instance, the sight of a rainbow, you can say, wow, it's fantastic, it's beautiful, or whatever, but, but then you stop. While uh, looking for a perch or a crocodile, you can, you can continue asking and you can generate new questions and, uh, and answers. So it's a, in fact, it's a deep difference between diverse curiosity and wonder. But what I am going to focus on is more a third mode on asking. And this is um, a kind of curiosity which gradually develop throughout child development and is more associated with um, existential questions, deep questions. What is truth? How is the world created? What is it all about? Deep existential curiosity is also associated with what we know as the Faustian man. Um, and it's typically uh, associated with, um, uh, with the European uh, culture since the Renaissance. Uh, 
and its core motive is, of course, science. Science, not narrow taken, but taken science as our way of thinking, our way to uh, restless ask new questions, find new perspectives. Um, the reason why you decide to spend your time listening to my talk and talk with me afterwards, and the reason why I uh, wanted to make this talk is typically for deep existential curiosity. We all very good know uh, we will not get an answer, uh, but we will develop. So development um, intimately connects to deep existential curiosity. So that will be uh, the focus point of my talk. Interestingly, diverse curiosity and wonder. Uh, you can find that in all cultures and you can find that among all uh, historical uh, periods, while the, the special kind of deep existential curiosity is an exception. You won't find it across cultures, you won't find it across history. In general, uh, cultures have considered curiosity with skepsis, uh, and most civilizations has been ruled, have been ruled by old men, old rules, old laws, and old gods. And innovation, novelties, uh, and curiosity has been considered as risky business. Yeah, I'm on schedule, in fact. So, um, leaving deep existential curiosity uh, on this slide, I will continue and uh, go over to uh, the um, twin problem of deep existential curiosity, which is development. Um, development is a puzzling issue because it means that something changes while at the same time remains the same. I mean, from year to year, we see our uh, lovely children growing up in, at school and we recognize them at the same uh, as the same persons all the time, but at the same time they change. Isn't that strange? I think it's really strange. How can something change and be the same at the same time? Uh, many of you will um, make uh, uh, will drop in and talk about uh, development in the frame of nature and versus nurture, and I will warn against that because I think. It's, it's a tempting answer, which is not in reality an answer to the problem, what is development? Uh, let me exemplify that with an oak nut. If you put an oak nut into soil, what happens there? What happens during the first year, the second year, and during a few hundred years? Well, the, out of the oak nut, it comes to a tiny small root going into the soil, branching out in new small roots, fine, hairy, fine and thin, almost invisible. Um, but the thing is, uh, the important thing is that these roots ex exudate, uh, they give up of hormones and uh, soluble um, compounds which um, calls for a special bacterial community around the roots. A bacterial community which wasn't there a year before is now developing, and not only bacterial, but also uh, mycorrhiza, and it's a whole fauna of protists developing around the roots, which weren't there before. And above the surface, under the canopy, each, even, each autumn, the leaves are falling down. These leaves are changing the soil so that after a few years, the soil has changed so much that new plants, new herbs are starting to grow underneath the canopy. And uh, the canopy as well 
um, changes the microclimate around the stem and the bark change and um, so the environment around the tree as it grows larger change also the environment and the environment influence how the growth of the tree is. Did you get that point? So it's not a matter of nature or nurture. It's a matter of circular interaction between the tree, between, between the growing oak tree and the environment. Uh, so my core point, and I think that is quite a, a take home message when you are a teacher, development is not a matter of causality, but a systemic circular patterns before where factors may be thought of as both cause and effects, depending on the point of view, B depending on the position you take, you can consider, for instance, the soil around the roots as cause or as effects for the growth of the oak. Um, <clears throat> this, this systemic circular, circular, circular um, way of thinking is quite hard to grasp actually, because it, uh, it hides behind uh, what we understand. Um, Churchill said, uh, addressing us, we shape our buildings, and thereafter the buildings shape us. It's quite much the same. Uh, and for evolutionary biologists, and uh, sorry to say, I'm an evolutionary biologist, so I have to take one funny example from from evolution. You see here um, two beavers, and the beaver, to be a beaver is really a problem because. Uh, you are adapted to live to a life in water. You you are adapted to swimming. You are adapted, adapted to diving and to, to to live in water. But you have a problem if you are a beaver, and that is you want to go into the wood because in the wood there are the aspens and there are the willows there, and you love the aspens and the willows. You want to eat them. So so we have a big problem uh, because the food of yours is in the forest, and you are adapted to river. To a river, life in water. But so everybody knows what the beavers are doing. <laughs> they are making dams. They're making dams. Uh, the dams are causing floods, and uh, through those floods, the beavers can swim into the woods and find their food. So instead of evol evolving into a new species, the beaver change the environment to be more like a beaver. If you look at this over evolutionary uh, time spans, you get the funny uh, situation. If you ask, to what is a beaver adapted? In fact, uh, to some degree, one might say that the beaver is adapted to itself, to the environment itself created. Uh, this phenomenon, which, which is actually now quite uh, much discussed and, uh, and acknowledged, uh, is labeled niche construction. The niche construction concept is what you see when you see an um, anthill, wasp nests, birds' nests, and of course, especially as Churchill mentioned, the houses, the lives we are doing are all excellent examples of niche constructions. And now, uh, one scientist, which uh, usually is not very popular among anthroposophers, uh, Steven Pinker, he has introduced a very interesting perspective to try to understand what is going on when a child is developing. And his suggestion is that we are doing similar things like beavers, but not in the environment. We are doing that cognitive in our own cognition. We are constructing, uh, similar to what beaver are doing, are we constructing uh, our own uh, um, uh, cognition throughout development, throughout our childhood? It sounds strange, but uh, everybody has a mirror at home, and a mirror is typically um, an example for what 
that uh, Steven Pinker is pointing to. Because what you see in the mirror is yourself. And then you, then you may improve or change what you see and change uh, the habit of yours. That means that you see something, you see an aspect of yourself, a physical aspect in this case, and then you, then you moderate something, you change something, you improve something or whatever. It's quite a strange thing, this, this cognitive niche construction. But we are used to it, although we are not used to the term. For instance, t-shirts uh, where you can read, follow your dreams or uh, just do it like the Nike, uh, Nike says, or sky is the limit. What is that? What does that mean? That means that follow your dreams means that, uh, how should that be possible? It is possible. We know that it's possible, how, but how should that be possible? It can only be possible because I create, I create my dreams, I develop my dreams, and thereafter, thereafter I follow them. Quite strange. Uh, I should, that means that I, similar to beavers, I create my cognitive or emotional environment. And after that, I adapt to that environment which I created. Um, infants are doing this all the time. And we are doing it with the infants all the time as well. Um, for instance, the tooth, the tooth fairy, I'm sure many of yours and I as well, told my kids when they lo lost, has, had lost a tooth, I told about the tooth fairy, which would come during night and, and give them a coin in a glass of water. Magic histories or Santa Claus or quite otherwise, let's say a kid, fant a fantasy of a kid could be, uh, it's a monster in the toilet or in the closet or underneath the bed in my, so I cannot sleep there. What's happening then? When, when I imagine it's a monster in the closet, in the, uh, then this imagination, this fantasy starts to be part of my emotional and cognitive environment. And I start to respond to this environment. That means that my further development will partly be influenced by the imaginations and fantasies which I myself create. That means that um, child development could be viewed as a self-generating process. And many scientists, developmental scientists have gone into this fascinating issue. For instance, Ed Tronick and Marjorie Beagley, uh, they are writing in a paper from 2011, infants are dynamic systems made up of multiple subsystems, brains, physiological processes and behavior, and body, of course, as well, that continuously interact with each other and with the external world in a circular causal fashion. There you have it again. You cannot say what is cause and what is effect because it's circular. Moreover, infants' ongoing engagement with the external and internal worlds contributes to the representations, the meanings they create. They create meanings. It's a monster in the closet. It's a meaning content. They create all their experiences and in turn, these meanings are shaped by those engagements. These self-organizing processes via positive and negative feedback also lead to the emergence, emergence of new systemic properties, including new developmental capacities, such as the ability to walk, for instance, or use language, which in turn create new meanings. Uh, this is the reason why we can really say that each child is a wonder and each child is um, an individual wonder which could never have been predict predicted, predicted because human development in childhood to a great extent is self-creation. 
Um, and that comes close to what Rudolf Steiner also um, had in mind when he was talking about how we should understand um, child development. And it leads us to two distinct questions, which at the same time could be the core question, uh, which already, already Rudolf Steiner uh, put out 100 years ago. How can education nourish the ongoing uh, bodily, cognitive niche construction of each child? How can education support, give input, but not in a way that would be predictable, the, where the outcome could, would be predictable, in a way where the child uh, in individual way take uh, and get nourished by what we contribute to him. That is, a, that is, that is almost not an, a normative question, it's more a descript, descriptive process actually, because we could, we could even ask similar questions also to, to other existences as animals. But now is another question which is normative, strongly normative, and that is how can education promote deep curiosity? and joy of life, long learning, and human flourishing. Uh, which, which is the core problem of any society based on development, because any society based on development is directly dependent on the will willingness on the, uh, of the members to lifelong learning and joy of learning and uh, to promote human flourishing. <laughs> I want to read the, the, the quote from Rudolf Steiner as well, but I uh, unfortunately I cannot see it anymore because I only see you, you all the participants. Uh, so because my, my PowerPoint slides is somehow uh, hidden behind what- We can yeah. see it, Marcus, okay. we can see it. Okay. I, okay, our highest endeavor must be to develop free human beings who are able, able of themselves to, yeah, and then I cannot see anymore. <laughs> okay, okay, but anyway, yeah, you can see it, that's the main thing. And of course, I just, just the last word about playing, because play is an excellent example on what um, niche construction, cognitive niche construction is about, because when you play, when children play, when, when infants play, they imagine, they have fantasies, and they create the situations they are imagining, and then they then they continue to de develop these fantasies and these uh, uh, these um, events further on, and these events generate new kinds of meaning, and these new kinds of meanings are put into new plays, playgrounds, or new terms and pro uh, and concepts. But now. Um, uh, I will use uh, the last part of my talk uh, to focus on uh, how the consequences for education and especially uh, science education. Uh, just got, uh, quite short, I will mention, spend only two minutes about kindergarten pedagogy and education uh, because you are all familiar with it. Um, down to the left, uh, it's, a, uh, it's actually me. I'm uh, analyzing some genetic uh, issues uh, in the lab uh, because I'm not, I'm not only a professor at uh, uh, Rudolf Steiner Uni um, University College, I'm also a scientist at the institute, research institute, so I also have that kind of... I'm, I'm, I added that picture to show uh, a typical adult behavior. This typical adult adult scientific behavior is about to reduce reality. Uh, it's quite important and decisive, of course, it's, it's, obligatory, it's mandatory for us that we, we, when we think, we generalize, we reduce the, uh, the, the richness, the diversity, 
the sparkling uh, reality surrounding us in order to find the rules and the patterns behind this diverse and sparkling reality. And it's a big problem when this kind of reductionism is brought into kindergartens. But we are happy to be, have colleagues uh, in Waldorf kindergartens uh, developing another uh, approach to uh, infants, uh, an approach I would call maximism. And what is maximism? Maximism is the opposite of reductionism. If, for instance, you see a um, uh, rainbow, you could see that reduction to re reduce it would be to explain it uh, due, to, due to its uh, electromagnetic waves. Uh, while maximize it would be to tell the infants it's a treasure at the end of the rainbow. What is happening then when you say that? Then you evoke the feeling in the kids that the world will have much more to offer in future. The world will show, it will, will release more of itself. Um, I mean, the tooth fairy is also an example of how we try to maximize the reality. I mean, uh, in reality, of course, uh, tooth fairies, they does not exist as don't um, Winnie the Pooh does not exist either. Uh, but uh, it invokes the feeling in children that the world is rich and each term and each concept can be saturated by expectations of new insights, new meanings, uh, new surprises, uh, like they also do in play and like they also do in um, when they are listening to stories and fairy tales. So the interesting thing about, about uh, kindergarten education is that instead of reducing reality, try to increase reality, promote reality, maximize reality, make it richer, more magic, more sparkling. Uh, and of course, children are easy, easily uh, going into that kind. Uh, so, in short, I make this part short be, uh, because I, I think uh, most of you are familiar with uh, with the Waldorf Kindergarten, uh, where this project is uh, run very well. And um, the core aspect uh, of kindergarten education associates to wonder, to wonder, to open the mind, mind of the infants uh, to all wonders, small and large ones, sparkling wonders in the surroundings, in the stories, in the imaginations and fantasies uh, we are telling them. But now comes a much more challenging problem. And that is, how do we transform this kindergarten wonder into school habits? Um, the thing is, if you are four, if you have a kid four years old or five years old, it's only nice then they believe in Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy or in Winnie the Pooh or in all the other magic uh, uh, figures and, uh, and so on. But imagine you get um, a student 12 years old still believing in the Tooth Fairy. That would make you really worry. If a 12 year old, the old kids believe in the tooth fairy, uh, it's really something seriously wrong. Something has changed. It's not easy to say what has changed, but uh, somehow the magic of the tooth fairy get lost on the way down up to 11, 12. It's not quite easy to say quite exactly what is happening, but 
uh, the reality is impoverished. It's not sparkling anymore in the same way as it did for a four years old. Um, Rudolf Steiner talks about crossing Rubicon and he is putting uh, uh, especially a uh, um, he's, uh, he's especially uh, pointing to the age between nine and ten. I'm not so sure if he is quite right. I'm not so sure if that is important either, if it's nine or ten or twelve or an eleven. I think there are individual differences. But somewhere on the way, the development change and it is a loss. It's a loss of meaning. It's a loss of magic. Uh, thus, that could uh, promote depressions. Depressions. What save the children when they are ten years old is that interests are starting up to be activated. Um, interests, and in the Waldorf School, of course. We, we distinguish quite strong between uh, first, second, and third grade, where uh, much of what we are doing with the children is embedded in, uh, in the feeling of magic, uh, in the myths, in the legends, in stories. But then it's a, quite a switch to the fourth grade when the children's get 10 years old. And it's interesting already from, uh, from Rudolf Steiner's side, and if not, we should have, we, we would have to, to stress it, but it's already there from Rudolf Steiner, Steiner's side. Um, he starts from another angle, from uh, to tra transform maximism into science. And now we are not talking about a period about animals, a period about flowers or mosses, or a period about stones. We are talking about scientific terms, zoology, botany, geology. And I think it's really important to, uh, to, to fulfill that expectation of the children. They are no longer now um, connected to the magic sparkling bird, bird. They are into another one, and that is, for instance, illustrated by collections. I would suppose if you are main, uh, if you are as other people, the listeners here, you had a period in your childhood where you did collect something. You collect minerals, fossils, butterflies, beetles. Uh, you 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 studied birds or whatever. You had some uh, some periods doing that interests are starting up at this period in the kids. The interests, although they, 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 are, they are interested in the diversity of specific issues, for instance, butterflies, starting to look into the, how many different butterflies do I see? Num numerous or birds or fishes or plants or mosses or stones, minerals, crystals. And, uh, and now it's really a pity that I cannot read for you the, the quotation from Rudolf Steiner, because that is really an important one from, from my side. Just can you read it for us? Yes. Uh, because I, I just want to say, now we go into a period in the school, and I'm a little bit worried if we succeed now. We are going into a period, an age, their learning of facts is very, very important. To learn a, a high amount of diverse facts about the world, let's say geography, let's say grammar, let's say history, let's say botany, let's say geology, whatever the learning of facts has its main impact period uh, from nine to 12 years. Just can you read it for us? Because I think it's from, yeah, you see from where it is. Um, the Rudolf Steiner quotation, yeah? Yep. 
The force of the soul on which particular value must be set during this period of development is memory. Development of memory is bound up with the molding of the etheric body. Since the latter takes place in such a way that the etheric body becomes liberated between the change of teeth and puberty, so too this is the tune for a conscious attention from without to the growth and cultivation of the mem memory. If what is due to the human being at this time has been neglected, his memory will ever after have less value than it might have that it that it might otherwise have had. It is not possible later to make up for what has been left undone. Thank you. Thank you, Jos. So uh, Rudolf Steiner's point here is to stress the importance of learning to use the memory to, to learn a high amount of facts. Um, well, I will now turn to how this transform in uh, during puberty and adolescence. Uh, we have wonder in kindergarten um, of, the, uh, of the senses sparkling reality. We have the diversity uh, stimulated, which also stimulates the diverse curiosity uh, in the primary school. And what happens now? The more you approach uh, puberty, the, the, the classes, the, the students are uh, showing higher, even yeah, higher and higher mastery, motoric mastery, rhetoric mastery. And if you have done your job as a teacher, they also know a lot about the world. So they have in general, a high degree of mastery. What they don't have is a, a organ for complexity. For, for the pre-puberty, uh, pre for the uh, sixth grade uh, student, a spade is a spade. And that makes uh, his worldview rather simple and straightforward. <clears throat> but it's a mismatch between uh, his ability, his knowledge, his rhetoric capacity, and even his physical um, abilities and his, um, respond, his potential responsibility. And that is, that is what the history also teaches us when it says curiosity kills the cat. Um, during puberty, or the puberty is a recurring issue where, where humans do things which they have to pay their whole life through. One example is the kite runner from Khaled Hosseini, <clears throat> where a 12 year old boy lets his friend down and he has to spend his whole life to, to, uh, to put together again what was broken there. Or sleep, <coughs> sleeping fairy, uh, the fairy tale of a sleeping fairy. It's a, quite inter interesting. This, uh, the princess, she's uh, she's running around as a small princess, as a as a small girl on the on the flower flowering meadows around the castle as a girl. But then one day when she's fifteen, something changed. She has changed because suddenly she sees something which she has never seen before: a door. And she, she started to get curious, what's behind that door? And she opens that door and she comes and you know the story. So curiosity kills a cat. Or as Thomas Hobbes said, hell is truth seen too late. And that is especially true for puberty. Um, this motive, um, of course, we know it from the expulsion from paradise, but it's also a personal motive in many of the students we have at school, as it is a motive in our, our own life as well. Um, 
And uh, interestingly, um, yeah, I, I want to keep it a little longer still. Um, the thing is, you are doing things when you are 13, uh, where you, which makes you deeply ashamed. And I believe that this ashamed being ashamed opens a new space in your heart, quite in private and quite away from all teachers and all other persons, where uh, deep existential curiosity also grow. Because uh, recognizing I am potentially destructive, I have done bad things, is also a precondition which may lead you to the, ins to, to the longing for new insights. <clears throat> and typically, um, teenagers say, suddenly they say, uh, I don't know myself anymore. This, a spade is not anymore a spade. Uh, the word turns out to be ambiguous. And that is also the reason why we have trouble to, to win discussions with the rhetoric pre uh, school classes, because we are adults, so we doubt all the time. We feel uh, ambiguous about problems and they are not ambiguous to those issues at all. They, they, they talk straightforward because a spade is a spade and don't try to tell me otherwise. And we know they are wrong, but we cannot say it. So that's a typical problem uh, during that earth, uh, during that age. So this, this is a situation where you start to get prepared for science because science differ from um, cramming facts. Facts uh, in the primary school, it's very, very important to, to, to learn facts, to learn, to cram. Um, rivers in Asia, uh, lands, uh, countries of Africa, um, historical events, whatever you want, uh, mathematical uh, concepts, whatever. You have to cram it and you have to learn it. But that is not science. Science has to be personal, conquered, has to be personalized. Uh, and any insights or value will depend on your ability to, uh, to internalize it, to make it personal. And now uh, knowledge becomes, uh, its theories becomes important. Um, science deeply differ from, uh, I just want to tell you a wonderful thing about poverty. Look about this. Uh, I'm sure you are not aware of it, uh, of it but you should be. Um, there are uh, neuro psychologists studying what is going on uh, in the frontal lobe of teenagers uh, during puberty. And astonishingly, uh, surprisingly, they find um, cellular change patterns very comparable to what is going on in the pupa during the metamorphosis of insects, for instance, butterflies. Um, and I think it's a wonderful imagination which you should, should uh, take with you. Um, uh, from those two uh, Japanese uh, scientists who writes that there is really a compelling perspective that birds and mammals and humans as well, of course, in fact, undergo a neural metamorphosis during puberty and adolescence, similar to insects. Uh, this comes come, come quite close to what uh, Rudolf Steiner says, and I think it's a beautiful imagination. It helps us also to to, to be aware of the beauty which hide behind uh, the everyday stressing uh, situation which 
uh, teenagers might, might uh, call and provoke in, in the teachers. But let me at least uh, you spend uh, five minutes uh, talking about science. What is science? The problem and the challenge with, uh, and, and the wonderful thing with science compared to facts is that science gives you models and natural laws. And models are core, uh, core elements of any scientific uh, teaching. And I hope even in Waldorf schools that you use a lot of time showing the classes uh, in during teenager time, uh, the core models which explains our which explain our world. Because these models um, they serve as pathfinders for the teenagers thinking and they are guidelines. And as well, there are common insights in our community. And if you are not familiar with them, uh, you are in fact not a fully member of this community. So, and I, I, I have seen uh, repeatedly a fear for explaining models uh, in science education in other schools. And I would encourage you to teach all the models you can. But let me demonstrate that at the end with an example, what I mean, the model has to be balanced with empirical um, data, which are in conflict with the models. So at first you will have to teach the models, for instance, showing them the solar system. Uh, many of you have seen this, uh, all of you are familiar with those, um, uh, this, uh, this, um, these pictures like the one up here with all the planets and the sun and so on. And it looks, uh, maybe you even have it in the classroom, but it's a model. You know why? Because uh, uh, if you should do this right, for instance, if you imagine the sun as big as a football, um, you would have to put the earth as a dust coin, a dust, uh, a dust particle 30 way, uh, meters away that's out in the schoolyard, so you wouldn't have space for it. So the model cannot, cannot reflect the reality. And it's quite fascinating after being familiar with such models to imagine how it is in reality and how it differs from reality. And a similar, uh, a similar example is, for instance, uh, the model of uh, genetic egoism which uh, many of you will be quite aware of. For instance, uh, you will know the history about, uh, and genetic egoism is of course a very important uh, uh, model in uh, evolutionary biology, um, promoted especially by Richard Dawkins. And uh, the, the classical example is, you know what happens uh, in a lion pride if the dominant male somehow disappears and the pride is, taken in by another dominant male, you know what will happen? What will happen is that the male, uh, the new male will kill the cubs. And this, that's a perfect example for the model of uh, genetic uh, egoism and uh, natural selection. And you should never uh, leave this, uh, this model unexplained. It's quite important that the students learn all those models like those. But the example is cherry picked. Look here, another example, which is not consistent with the model. And that can regenerate uh, curiosity. Because listen now, you don't know it, but uh, I, I'm sure you won't know it, but adoption is probably more common among mammals than uh, killing the cubs. Even among, among lions is um, adoption very widespread on the picture down, you will see a lioness giving milk to a, to a leopard cub. So adoption 
this isn't consistent with, with, uh, with the theory of genetic egoism at all. What happened now? What happened is that you got cu curious again. Because you fir first I teach you the classical model, and that's quite important because you get happy. You can understand new things when you learn those new model models, as you can understand new things when you learn the solar system, like uh, on, the, uh, on the picture above. But then, then you start to wonder, re-wonder again, if you only give answers uh, which closes and not answers which also opens to new questions, then you have a problem. And of course, we see that problem around us, that science uh, is presented as giving answers on everything. And that's, of course, a big problem. But in the Waldorf schools, we should uh, maintain a balance between, uh, between answers which closes, let's, and that would be models, and answers which are inconsistent with the models, so that the students know both are getting familiar with the models and are uh, renewing their deep personal scientific curiosity uh, with getting new answers, which opens for new uh, questions. Okay, I think that time is out. Um, I didn't have time to tell you everything I wanted to tell you, but at least it could be a starting point. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Markus. You can have my, uh, five more minutes more if you, if you want to add something. It's, it's we, are, we are, have plenty of time. Could we do that? Uh, I can add something when, uh, when we talk together. Couldn't we do that? Simply? Yes, great, great. Thank you so much. Yes. So thank you for the talk and for the wonderful examples and images you gave us. And let's see if there are already some questions coming in. While, while, while we wait for that, I can simply say, the red thread in my talk is the way from wonder to diverse curiosity to deep uh, existential curiosity connected to science. And I think Waldorf education demonstrates that quite neatly how this progress is. We should just be aware of uh, this is not natural, it's cultural, it's, it's a normative approach. Thank you. There's a question by Graham. Oh, hello, Marcus. Hello. And, and everyone. Um, I have a question about something you said right at the beginning. You spoke about addressing a kindergarten child with the question of the tooth fairy. And I think uh, Santa Claus came in later. And you seem to imply, and this is my question really, because I, I really couldn't believe what I was hearing, so it may not be what you intended. You seem to imply that somehow the world does not hold wonder for a young child, but we as adults need to impose onto the reality, as you put it, of the world, the mystery and excitement of the Tooth Fairy and Santa Claus and other things in order to cultivate their sense of wonder. Now, the implication there is that we should tell lies in order to stimulate the children's sense of wonder. Now, I put that in a <laughs> very, very crude way, but that's what I heard you say. And so I'd really like to hear you uh, again. And if you're saying that, then please do say it boldly. That's fine. And I, I know what I've heard. <laughs> so there we are. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, I, of course, I don't have a clear, clear cut answer to, to this problem, which is obvious a problem, but... I'm sorry, I mean, how obvious? Uh, the, the, problem you, obvious? Uh, the problem you are pointing to is obviously a, a, a big one and a serious one. I, but, I don't have any problem with it at all. Sorry, I, uh, I only had a problem I, with what you said. I mean, the problem said. of lying, is it a lie or is it not? But I... Um, 
to me, to me, I wouldn't be too, do you say, puristic. I wouldn't be too narrow thinking. Uh, I would be generous to children's lasting, the children's need for imaginations, for spin-off histories. I wouldn't care very much if all these are deep imaginations uh, connecting to archetypes or to spiritual uh, pictures of any kind. I would also tell them strange, funny, small stories about grasshoppers uh, playing just in the uh, summer evenings and so on. Although, yeah, to some extent, uh, it's, it's a lie. It's a lie. Fantasies to for the strict rational adult is a lie, but um, but um, the imagination of children is in excess all the time. It's it it's um, um I don't know how to tell you, say say it in English. But forgive forgive me, but I I haven't made myself very clear, and I'm so sorry because I sort of agree with that. Mm. Uh, but what I heard you say was that we should tell the children, say, about the Tooth Fairy or mm -hmm. Santa Claus, which is, yeah. to my mind, not an imagination, as you're describing, about grasshoppers yeah, yeah, talking yeah. to one another, which is a wonderful thing to do and very appropriate. But somehow we need to tell them such conv con convoluted uh, things <laughs> which are sort of made up in order to stimulate their wonder. And I sense that they have that wonder and that curiosity. And our task is not to stimulate it, but to sort of nourish it <laughs> so that yeah. was my my concern that somehow we need to do something to them to get them wondering that's the bit that i okay uh, i see you i think i see your point and i don't have a clear-cut answer um, okay fine that's fine that's okay it's fine but 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 my experience i have even had some work in the kindergarten and my natural response to the children's interests and questions is to not only to give rational answers, but also to give uh, fantasy answers to tell, they, they ask to, they start to tempt me to, to, to find new approaches, to tell new things and to small stories about flowers, about stones, about beetles. Uh, not all very seriously, but well, that's, yeah. I think they have that dem demand or that need, and I respond to that need. Thank you. Um, may I have a question? Yeah. Um, I, I listened with great joy, Marcus, to your uh, ideas. But is it not too narrow to talk about only about children? If you look the immense popularity of something as Harry Potter hmm. that goes over the ages, that goes, that goes far beyond childhood. Hmm. And is there not a deep longing uh, in, in mankind as such to have such stories, just independent of they are true or not, but they are full of imagery. How you how you understand that, Marcus? Or is that for you an uh, aberration? I, I'm not. I'm. I, I'm. I'm. I'm not quite sure what I should think about Harry Potter because uh, just see the phenomena. Yeah. I, I, the phenomenon, that's, that's obviously a need. Uh, on the other hand, uh, what I did not mention in my talk is that I think in the primary school, when you start, when you start getting interested in natural things, I wouldn't say science, but in, in collecting things, for instance, you start to get fascinated with your senses loving butterflies and that kind of a thing. Um, I think it's quite important at the same time to promote art, 
to work artistic in drawings, in paintings, in music, in poetry, um, in parallel. I'm not quite sure, but I would think that maybe Harry Potter um, symbolize or give face to a need uh, of imaginations which could be reached also by activizing more artistic activities in school. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I could agree with you, but there is still the fact that, uh, that, it is, that there is a huge longing for this type of literature. And that longing goes over childhood. It goes over the time of childhood. Mm -hmm. That is uh, for me so fascinating. I think the question is independent of the of the content. The question by Christoph um, is in the background is that you um, mentioned the the um, idea of magic. Yes, you said okay. there is a magic experience of the world, a magic um, connection to the world, and at a certain age, you said we lose that magic. Um, mm -hmm consciousness and we, we we somewhat set into a more neutral and scientific um, consciousness and what Christoph is is, is now uh, um, hinting with with Harry Potter is a bit the question where is the magic and is there um, also um, in puberty because those are the students who read Harry Potter and see it And is, a, is, is it still there, a longing for magic? And how can we can we deal with it in, in school? I, I would like to comment on that. I think what you say, just is, uh, is really interesting. But uh, and and exactly to that point, I, in its extreme, Harry Potter, uh, in my opinion, promotes a rather loose consciousness, a rather um, fabulous, even among adults, it could somehow um, promote some kind of excarnation, uh, which also loosens your connection with, your, with the reality. And I think uh, science, Science, if you combine, if you use, if you, if you are making science in the way I tried to show you, where you're not using science as giving answers only, but also awakening questions, but conscious questions, intellectual challenging questions to the students, questions which, uh, which, which they, uh, invoke struggle and fighting and discussions and wonder. I think this deep existential uh, curiosity, which I am talking about, is typical for that one, is that wonder is emerging in the uh, knowledge itself, in the terms and concepts. It's no longer uh, um, present maybe, of course it's still present when I see the rainbow, I, I'm still touched, deeply touched and wondering. But if I think if Waldorf education succeed, then wonder will be activated in knowledge itself, in erkenntnis, in, in, the, in the act of thinking. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I think that is an element which heals thinking and heals the cognition and also makes it easier to deal with uh, Harry Potter without uh, losing your mind, so to say. Thank you. There's a question by Kevin. Maybe you can put it yourself. Yes, it was, it was regard to some of the, uh, some of Steiner's indications are really very difficult, as we know, uh, even with regard to what he suggests um, about uh, things that should be taught to children. Um, and I'm thinking of such things as the British Isles floating 
being held in place by the stars uh, and such like. Now, these were contentious in his time, and I think are even more so now. And I just thought what we, we might want to say in relation to that. I would never say anything about such uh, crazy ideas to children <laughs> or to students. I think this part of uh, Rudolf Steiner's work is 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 not an uh, rel in, uh, issue of relevance at all. I think it's a misunderstanding. It's not uh, it's not from the Akasha Chronic. It's it's misunderstanding. It's a big issue, and we cannot do it here. But my opinion is that. Uh, Rudolf Steiner's weakest deliverances is science, because uh, and he he admits that he, in his bio, in his self biography that natural nature was was not familiar to him, and he had really to struggle with that. I would be I would I think it's completely wrong to to follow uh, Rudolf I, uh, Rudolf Steiner at that point. I think in all. I love Rudolf Steiner because of his conceptual approach to pedagogy, to education. And we have to understand what he tries to show us. We have not to take him word by word. We have to, to um, conquer our own position uh, based on his perspectives. And I have demonstrated that how that can be done in my new book mentioned at the beginning of this lecture. Okay, can I, can I then just take that a little further? Because something I think that is taught in just about every school in Britain, at least, and I've certainly seen, seen it in uh, other countries as well, is the description of the development of plants, starting with fungi and so on, uh, going up, uh, where he relates that development to um, the child, to the development of the child. Mm. Again, a difficult concept, because es essentially what he appears to be doing is giving a picture of the development of plants, but in fact, it's a poetic conceptualization of how those plants exist within their environment. But it's more poetic than scientific. And I wonder if you'd say the same there. No, I wouldn't. Uh, to the extent that you have um, conquered that uh, perspective yourself, I think you can also manage to use it in the classroom. The problem is if you use that as a receipt and, uh, and uh, try to follow it uh, word by word, then it won't work. And you will run into a problem in the classroom. Okay. okay. But, but I think you should be careful. I think what, what Rudolf Steiner tried to do, and it, but, but of course we should talk a lot of this, and I'm sure I, I don't have a final answer, but even in zoology and the concept he's using there, um, I mean, in his book, uh, Allgemeine Menschenkunde, uh, he is, uh, he's going very deeply into this concept and shows that it's, yeah. Um, so there are parts there as well where, where I think uh, it really would be useful to discuss it and find out, but my opinion is, uh, try to understand what he's pointing to. He might not be right in all the examples he's using. He might not be right in all the con in all the um, yeah truths he is saying. That doesn't matter. It's hundred years ago. Uh, the concept, the, the the approach, uh, the approach is the important thing. Okay. Can, can I then hook that back? Sorry, because I, I want to pick up on what you said was saying about Harry Potter. Because I would say you could say the same thing in that landscape and the same thing could, could be said about science fiction and such like, not that I'm a particular aficionado of such things, but the Potter thing let, sets up a hypothesis, a, a hypothetical universe where magic prevails, but actually it's a discussion of fascism and how fascism arises. Yeah. Yeah. Could be very interesting. And I, I would love to, to uh, elaborate that further because I'm sure you're right. And, uh, it's a mi mixture. I mean, there are sci science fiction histories which, which, which uh, are almost spiritual in their way, uh, in their mode, in their imaginations, which they develop. Uh, so I don't know quite a clear answer, but uh, and even so to Harry Potter, I don't, I'm not quite sure. And uh, Tolkien as well. I, I'm a little bit confused about Tolkien. I'm not quite sure what I um, should think about 
No need to, no need to do, no need to do it. <laughs> you gave us um, enough um, to think about. So I'm very happy about those um, ideas. Are there other questions? Maybe from my side, you know, the point, um, what, what you stressed that there is in, in childhood, there is some kind of richness in, in, in reality. And there is what I said before, there is this magic. And then um, the moment we, we enter the, so, so to speak, scientific consciousness, which is the conscious, consciousness of our time, um, we have that idea of reductionism, so that we, we have a materialistic way of explaining everything. And we um, see there is something missing. And you, you, you said in your lecture, there is some kind of depression coming out of that worldview. And, you know, the idea could be, of course, out of Waldorf schools, now in order to teach materialistic science, we do spiritual science, so to speak. So we give all the spiritual impacts. And Steiner never did that in school, as far as I know. He didn't, he didn't um, 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 wanted, he didn't want the, the teachers to, to teach some spiritual stuff. He said anthroposophy, anthroposophy should not enter the school. But and this is something which is quite interesting. If we have a real phenomenological or Goethean approach, this, this is what he stressed. So if we get the, the young, young adults to really observe and have interest, you said that, interest in, in, in small things, interest in, in, in the world, there the magic appears in front of them. It's not the magic of a fairy tale anymore. Maybe this, is, this isn't the case. But, and this is interesting, it's a magic of, um, of the world of the senses. So we, have a, we, we enter a clear consciousness, we enter a, a real um, a clear observation. And by this, we see the magic in the phenomena. And this is something new. This is something which, if you if have, have a look at the early um, science approaches in the Middle Age and so on, it's not, um, there is no reductionism in it. It's just, it's a phenomenological attitude which really values what's appearing in front of us. And um, what I think, what Steiner says, we, we shouldn't teach abstract science, so to speak. The question going to abstract concepts who have no relation to the world of phenomena anymore, but teach science in a way that we have a close relationship to the phenomena and, and get the students to really obse observe what's going on in the world of the senses. Can you agree with that approach? Not at all. I think it's, uh, I really disagree. Um, first of all, I would say to the primary school, I think it's quite important there that you are not mixing in spiritual perspectives in zoology, uh, botany, geology, or chemistry, or whatever you are teaching. Um, during this period before puberty, you should help the students to trust their uh, Verstand, I don't know the English word, to trust their intellect. Mind. Where, what? Their mind, they should trust their mind. They sh you should give them the feeling it's reliable. And Steiner says, um, if you succeed as a teacher, you are an authority. That means that what you tell them is truth. And that's the healthy situation in the primary school. You should rely on the teacher because the teacher knows the truth and the truth is blah, blah, blah. And a spade is a spade. Uh, so you should not, uh, but if you want to promote spirituality, you uh, should- uh, Sorry, you. sorry. I think you didn't understand me right. No, I, I'm coming to your point. Okay, because um, I really said um, there should be no spirituality in it. I yeah, said. yeah but, but I think it's quite important to be a little bit puristic there. And if you want to promote it, you should rather use art. You should rather uh, parallel, in parallel also, let them pay and do all the artistic work. But then, when you go into science, um, I think it's urgent, important that you are using abstract models, that you learn the abstract models. You run the, otherwise the risk that the students 
who want really to go strong into science, they don't get stimulations to do that because the teachers always say, just look at the phenomena and it's nothing to see. I, I, I am quite critical to the way phenomenology is used in everyday life in Waldorf schools. It's quite blurry the way it's used. And so too often I see simply uh, repeat, uh, look into the, uh, for instance, into the experiments of chemistry. Yes, I can and, and understand I can chemistry. Speak. You cannot understand chemistry without the atomic model, without the, without the molecular structure. You cannot understand <laughs> or explain anything then. I really want to come in and say that I, I have to disagree that uh, uh, there is a we're talking about an age of child now. It's vital that teenagers learn about the atomic model. But I have taught chemistry for many years. And you can do that without an atom in sight. It's completely yeah. unnecessary to have yeah. a model yeah. until they're at the age when they actually have the thinking capacity and the interest to develop a model. So I, I have to say, as you disagreed with yeah. Jost, <laughs> I have to say that I, I really disagree with, yeah. with you, Marcus, there. So it's a very vital conversation we need to have. Yeah, here. yeah. It's fundamental. Uh, I understood Steiner in this way that he said you should give the high school students the opportunity to live also with models. Absolutely. But not as the basic of understanding of science. And right. That is the new approach. And that was for me always so fascinating. Thank you, But Christoph. Jos, next yeah. week we can continue this conversation huh, when we have... Uh, uh, Different summer, yes. 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 With, with Summer, who is an expert. In Maybe I would just want to say one thing. What you um, criticize about um, Goetheanism or phenomenology in Waldorf School maybe is not what I was talking about. So I was much more referring to Martin Wagenschein and this tradition of um, having science teaching, which is still related to experiences. And um, this is something maybe this is missing very often in, in um, purely abstract science. There is a deep misunderstanding going on here, which could be so fruitful. It could be so fruitful if we explored this tremendous misunderstanding here. I will enjoy joining that conversation. Yes. Yeah, we, we are at the end of our time. And it's, it's in fact, um, thank you so much, Markus. And in fact, next um, Tuesday, we have a lecture by um, another um, professor for, for um, didactics of science. This is Wilfried Sommer from, from Kassel, and he's also affiliated to Alanus University. And he is speaking about the dialogical dimension of general didactics. And he, yeah, well, maybe we can have a discussion on that point again. We will see. Furthermore, I would like to say for the first time, we will have two lectures next week. So this is due to the fact that I was very happy to um, get um, Neil Boland from Auckland University in New Zealand. Um, he is, he's lecturing too, but due to the um, time um, difference we have, he is um, giving us his lecture as a video. So we, we, we won't have it live next Tuesday, but it will be um, um, available and you can download it. And this is a pity we can have a, can't have a live discussion with Neil Boland, but nevertheless, I'm quite happy that he is contributing too to our um, um, series of lectures. And he is having, he said himself, the title of his lecture will be Waldorf Education, a view from the periphery. So this implies that there's a center and that might be somewhere around Europe. And he is maybe um, thinking that New Zealand is some kind of a periphery. I don't agree with that idea. I think um, Waldorf Education has a center everywhere where it happens. So for me, it's like a view from, from another center. But nevertheless, I'm looking forward to his contribution, and we will have two um, contributions next week. So thank you so much, Marcus, and have a good week. Have a good, good night and good day, and looking forward to see you next week. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye. Thank see you. you then. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.